Okay, so we're planning on talking a little bit about home labs today, and uh, we'll start off there. But as usual, we'll branch off into wherever our, uh, wherever you know we can, where our minds take us. So uh, actually, John, Let me see if you have, you have a camera. <laughs> it's the wrong end of the camera, well, but <laughs> I'm trying to switch up. the camera. How do you switch the camera? Okay. Hmm. Yikes. Steve, you need a shave, my friend. I need a shower, shave. Well, yeah. blame that on the power. I, I haven't showered or shaved in a week. And we can smell you from here. Um. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, John, I actually think that this was your topic. So do you want to lead us off? What were you... Uh, did you have some things you wanted to talk about when it comes to home servers? Oh, I was actually... Well, so I'm super interested in setting up a home lab so i know we got a ton of people who are like familiar with that i work somewhat on servers remote like for a job but i've never really set up my own home lab um so i was hoping to get some more information about it because i know i've been watching uh learn linux tv uh jay over there he's got a huge playlist of like setting up his own stuff with proxmox and some other stuff so the reason I wanted to do the subject is I was hoping you guys had some information. I know, Matt, you were also talking about doing it. You wanted to do it at some point. I have so many plans. Um, uh, but yeah, I know. <laughs> plans, plans, plans. Um, but that that was the idea. I know there's ways to... Um, you can set up a starter one with a Raspberry Pi. I know you can set up a starter one with uh, even an old janky laptop or old tower that you got off of Facebook for 10 bucks. Um, I know there's ways to do it. Pretty much. Um, Pretty but, much the uh, way I, I did it. Is that how you did it, Jerry? So you're going to be the expert? Um, I, know I, also, I, I, also found, I also found... I started with... I started with this Raspberry Pi 1 B+. This was running Pi Hole and a very small instance of own cloud back then. And since then, I I had my... Cabby Lake i5 sitting around here and I was like, come on, let's just throw Proxmox on it and yeah. Now my i5 is my server. Oh. Nothing special, but uh, it's enough. I, also I have a sorry, I have Steve. a pipe. Oh, sorry. sorry, Steve. Sorry. Uh, I, I was supposed to raise my hand too. I'm sorry, my bad. I also put in the chat there's a Discord server that I found that's it's from a website, um, but it's called Noted, and they're all about home labs. I haven't dug into it, so I'm not <clears throat> I'm not advertising them. I don't know anybody over there. Um, so if they're garbage, they're garbage. But if you guys wanted to help me figure out whether they were garbage, that would be awesome, too. Uh, um, time for a brigade. brigade. Uh, Steve, go ahead. I have a Pi 4 that is actively being used uh, as my home lab server. It's got Joplin server to, uh, since your latest video, uh, Obsidian, the best note taken app. Well, uh, and you complaining about sync behind the paywall. Well, just use Joplin. No more sync uh, paywall behind the sync. Uh, but uh, yeah, I use it for uh, Vault Warden, for Bitwarden local uh, self-hosting Bitwarden server. Joplin, I use it for many other uh, download services, uh, uh, torrent services and stuff like that, but uh, for torrenting Linux. So um, other than that, it's uh, it's a pretty interesting little machine. Uh, it's the only thing that uh, I, I can figure out what to do with this little pie that I have. It was very easy to set up. And if you want any help, just uh, contact Kudu, your resident uh, Docker container mastermind. So I, I've been, I raised my hand. Matt, you can speak. Um. <laughs> uh, my so i've been looking into hardwares i think that's where i've been bottlenecked is because there's so many choices for what you can do so you can do it obviously with a pie if you can find one 
Uh, you can there's other single board computers that you can try. But I've been looking into these little mini PCs. They, they range from like 150 to about 600, 700 dollars or so. And some some of them depends on if they come bare bones or they got the, the, all the stuff in them. And I've been looking at these things and and they. My problem is that there's so many of them. So ETA Prime yeah. does like a video like two or three times uh, a week about a mini PC. And there's just so many. I'm like, I don't know, like, do I want one with a lot of memory? Do I want a Ryzen or do I want to go Intel? And the amount of choices for me, that's the bottleneck that I've been having. And then I, then I have to decide, do I want to go with a enclosure a hard drive enclosure that supports hardware raid or do i want to mess around with software raid there's just so many choices and i don't know you know which way i want to go yet because first of all it, i'm gonna end up spending a lot of money on hard drives i, I i've this i i think that my eyes are bigger than what they need to be when it comes to the amount of hard drive space that i really need but i, I think if i'm going to do a nas i might as well get like 100 terabytes or more <laughs> and people say hard drives are are cheap, but not when you're buying that much storage. Uh, go ahead, Jerry. Sorry. Um, <laughs> this is going to be really bad. Yes. I'm a horrible moderator. <laughs> Nobody should hire this guy. It's really bad. <laughs> go ahead, Jerry. <laughs> and, 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 <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, I mean... It depends. What are you going to do with your home lab? Well, I, I'm going to run Jellyfin for sure, because right now I run Jellyfin off from this this machine, so it's going to be a Jellyfin server. And then I want to ex basically just explore. Right? Mm -hmm. Steve talks about Portainer and all the, the, all the doctors <laughs> stuff he, he talked about. I want to get into that stuff too because it looks awesome and i know nothing about it like i tried to set up jellyfin as a as a docker or whatever and completely failed because their documentation for mm -hmm. running that thing in a container is utter garbage like if, if you're not a if, if you're a noob yeah. you, there's no way you can do it from their documentation so um i don't i don't, I don't anything about that so um i am not calling you yeah. trafficking but you can go next <laughs> You're calling troll bits, but uh, yeah. Um, okay. But yeah, uh, I have a um, a thirty-two bit, an old thirty-two bit. Uh, I mean, I guess it's like a a media PC or whatever. It was like like really old. It had like Vista <coughs> on it. It's like thirty-two bit. So I I have that, and uh, I was at a school that uh, like we, I knew a guy that worked at a school that I went to also, like you know like more like. It's like different than university. It's like right before university. It's like different than U U.S. But anyway, I was at school and he had a bunch of hard drives that he decommissioned from old computers, and they were one terabyte drives. So I got like five of them, RAID five. So I get four four terabyte in there, and because they're in a RAID, I can lose one. So you know they're older, so it's fine. And then re I did that, but then I didn't do anything with it for a while. It was just sitting there doing nothing. So recently what I did is I installed uh, three things. I installed NFS, so I can remote uh, mount the file system. I installed sync things because I use that to synchronize files. Now the good thing about sync things, now something like Microsoft uh, SkyDrive, OneDrive, the thing that's cool about it is that it's going to have, you can have local files and you can have always remote files like nfs right and you can just right click in windows and it's magic because it switches between always local having a local copy <coughs> and on the server and having only on the server but here there isn't really that we don't really have that but we can choose in between so for certain things i choose to have it always have a local copy and have it uploaded on the server like same things right which is like how you think of onedrive or even if you go offline for example my password file and uh, with, um, you know, it's like uh, TPSXE and my uh, all my notes, my TXT files, they're in the uh, sync things. So it means that I can uh, use my phone offline and then I can update them and I can get into my home network even if there's no external Wi-Fi and you can, it will automatically find it on the TCP network and update. Or I can be at school and it will update remotely going through a node on the internet. So my stuff is always synchronized. But then I also want to have really big files only on my NAS because I don't want it everywhere. That would be NFS. 
So that's what I use. And then on top of that, I also did a Git server, which I realized is super easy to do. Um, you literally just make a like a you literally just add a repo in on the storage on as your your user that you SSH into, and you just basically make a command that says a user. Like you use a git command, you put the user, you put the path on the server, and then it just grabs that. So like the GitHub URL isn't actually properly formatted. Like if you just have a server, like you, I could literally SSH into my laptop with Git and then update a repo. Like that's something I just realized that it was literally just a file somewhere, a folder somewhere. It, it kind of made me realize what Git really was. It's not just like some, you know, weird URL. No. It's actually just a repo somewhere on your on your server. But yeah, um, that's what I did with my server. And also, I have two 8 terabyte drives in a QNAP NAS. But that one, you, you, you use like a web interface and everything. So it's not really like fun. But yeah, that's basically what I've been doing uh, with my server so far. And it's funny because I did that like last week. I don't know why yeah, bother really to um, say this. But Alexi, I don't know why you can't hear us. So <laughs> I have no clue what's going on there. Anybody in, else in the audience having a problem hearing us actually say words? Um, if you are, I don't know how you're going to hear this because you obviously can't hear me, <laughs> uh, put it in the chat and we'll figure out what's going on. Uh, Steve, you can go ahead and go. Yeah. I, uh, when you mentioned, uh, that we are, we, we are spoiled for choices when it comes to mini PCs, there is, uh, there is one PC I would recommend to anyone. It's, it's an HP little horizontal thing. It, it's like this big, it's not very big but thin that you can put in a drawer or something. Uh, it's got 32 gigs of RAM and it's got a decent CPU, 5340G or something like that. But when you mentioned uh, Jellyfin, uh, you just reminded me that, the, the, uh, that you don't need to configure Jellyfin or follow the, the, the guide or anything. If you go to hub.docker.org or something, uh, they have already set already set up uh, Docker containers. All you have to do is to just uh, they have stacks. If you use uh, Portainer, they have stacks. You just copy paste the stack into Portainer, hit uh, publish or whatever, and it will just grab the image, set it up. All you have to do is replace the placeholder URL to your actual server URL or IP or whatever. But once you do that, it will attach itself to a, um, a port SQL or whatever, uh, whichever database it uses. It's going to create the database. It's going to create everything, and you're up and running within seconds or maybe a minute or two. So you just said uh, a whole bunch of words, and I had no clue what any of them mean. <laughs> the website, hub.docker.io. No, no, you don't, you, don't, you don't even really have to explain it, Steve, because, I, I mean, I understood the – the intent behind it that I have to learn more about Docker, but I don't, I know literally nothing you don't need about, to, no, no, you don't need no, to I mean, like, I don't Wait. know how, I mean, do you, my, my, do you I, mean I, something like this, Steve? Yeah. Something that's, like that. Yeah. That, yeah. That's, that's a small HP lead desk. This one in particular has a Ryzen 5 2400G, 32 gigs of RAM and one yep. terabyte SSD and would make, would be perfect for a small little server. Yep. Go ahead, Trobus. But yeah, I was just had to add that you should probably do a raid, at least a raid two. So maybe you would be better with something that has actual space for like, like two drives. Well, that's because why I was you thinking want the of jelly uh, with your music, right? What I was thinking of is getting because. Uh, get a mini mini PC and then getting one of those hard drive enclosures that will just hold like five things and then do some software raid that way. Um, mainly because then I don't yeah, have to. How work. do you connect it to the computer fast? Do you have like a SATA thing or well, maybe you have I mean, like a powerful type? The C one thing? that I was looking at has Thunderbolt, so it should be fine. Mm. Um, plus, I, okay. I'm I'm not a speed de demon. I don't need. Like I have, I I use OpenSUSE as my distro. Zipper is slow as fuck. It doesn't bother me. You know, like I don't care. I can just set it to go and and, and go do something different. So, I, if I need to, if I'm transferring over files, as long as it will is fast enough that I can you know stream a movie off from it, it's gonna be fine, and it will be. So that's that's not the the big deal. The reason why 
like Josh sent me this gigantic case that's perfect for NAS. It has a ton of hard drive bays. It's hot swappable. It's fantastic, right? It, he sent it to me for free. It's in there. It's in the box. The problem is, is it's effing huge and I have no room for it. So that's why I was looking at a mini PC and then a hard drive enclosure because then I can just, you know, put it in a small spot. I mean, I, I, I think you could even go with to uh, like USB like hard drive external hard drive well i mean i have one of those and the problem with the external hard drive is that they're all louder and shit because they put the like the, the bottom of the bin hard drives in them the thing that i i want to be able to do is just have that small thing but i think like my dream would be to like have a server rack with you know actual servers in it that'd be pretty cool but um they sound really really loud like you, you see people's youtube video and they sound like a fucking aircraft carrier in, in your room uh john did you have something to say um yeah and then i looked at my phone i was gonna say that you can get uh it's get mercury or whatever they have you know four or five year old servers like actual servers you can get them like a third of their actual price because a real real server now that's you know current state those things are thousands of bucks but you can get them for a couple hundred dollars if they're older yeah there's i'd look into that but they are loud as hell yeah so that's something something to worry about and they take up a lot of space that I, I was looking on ebay because because if you go on ebay you can find some really cheap like dual xeon servers that have you know 200 and whatever gigabytes of ram and all the space for hard drives and stuff and they're like 200 bucks like really really cheap and they're not even that like that old like just a couple years old um and and while i don't know the quality or whatever but the thing is first off they're huge i'd have to have a rack somewhere i'm worried about electricity consumption because i don't want to <laughs> electricity bill is already over 300 dollars a month i don't want to make that any higher and also i mean you just hear the fans in those things it sounds like you know 12 hair dryers going off all at once and it would, it would bug me so that's the reason why i've uh go ahead john do any of you um are you hosting uh applications for yourself on here i didn't quite hear if that was because one of my reasons for wanting to use uh, a home lab is there's a ton of open source like software solutions for business um that are self-hosted it's free if it's self-hosted you got to pay for the service if you host it with them um the thing up the one i'm thinking about right now is invoice ninja but do any of you guys run your own web apps the other one the other one is gitlab you can host gitlab yourself yep um i'm currently i'm currently hosting uh, a private note or whatever it's called private bin yeah uh, Private bin is a note-taking app with, oh, sorry about the electricity. It's, it'll be back in a minute. Um, but uh, it, it allows you to share uh, encrypted notes that self-destruct like uh, Mission Impossible style. Yeah. So uh, I love that. I, I self-host this uh, in, on, with uh, Joplin as well. So uh, amazing stuff. Uh, home lab is a, a good solution, but as Matt mentioned, we are spoiled for choices when it comes to uh, mini computers, uh, home lab servers. We can use anything uh, that that our heart desires, basically. Because, but the, the reason I don't go into mini PCs because their price, their prices are as high as regular desktop prices. So I can build a regular desktop uh, with that huge case that fits, that has four, uh, 14 hot swap bays uh, for hard drives. Uh, it's a Lian Li PC49 or 149 tower that has 14 hot swap bays. So I have that. That's my HTPC, which is running Manjaro. So, uh, but yeah, you can do whatever you want. Like. It, no need to buy mini PC specifically, unless you, like Matt said, again, he worries about electrical consumption. This is my case as well. Uh, go mini PCs. Uh, just just note that if you, the smaller the PC, the more you're gonna, and the more external drives you'll be connecting. Yeah, that's what I was looking for. Like a, a enclosure. The 
I think when it comes to actual applications that I am haven't got that far yet because of the hardware choices that I've been thinking about. But I know I want to do Jellyfin because I already do that. Uh, I wouldn't mind self-hosting Bitwarden because right now I use just the regular one. So it'd be kind of cool to mess around with. Either that or check out some of the other password manager things like uh, KeePass has self-hosted stuff and you can do that. Um, and, and then there are like... There, like the Google Photo Alternative Image, I think is the, the name of that one. Try that. Uh, there's a couple other ones that are just... There's all this really cool self-hosted stuff. And I, I think specifically if you want to start replacing a lot of the Google stuff that you kind of force to use, you can find awesome self-hosted stuff for that but i just haven't been able to get into it for, i mean i could if i wanted to just set up a linode or whatever and use it that way but uh i i feel i i think i feel more accomplished if i did it through a home lab so um go ahead go ahead patrol bus yeah um well I don't know if it's maybe it's just I'm I'm too minimalist or something, but I I can't really think. I mean the the private bin example is is pretty actually pretty nice because I did use that at some point. Um, but other than that, I I don't really. I mean, maybe Jellyfin could be interesting also, but most of the other things I just I don't think I'm really the target audience. I think I prefer using just a file system and just having my photos there or whatever. Um, but yeah, I, I might, I might try out Jellyfin at some point, but what's, what's the, what's the advantage of Jellyfin versus just like remote, like mounting an NFS and like playing the movie? Is it, is it going to, is it? I don't part? have to is mount that. I mean, it's literally just runs as a systemd service in the background as the server and. Yeah, and, but you have an auto mount when you log in, like when you, when the server starts. So like, my hard drives. I think, auto it, I think it compresses, it uses your graphic card to compress the video and send it over. Well, plus, I mean, there's a UI for it, and you can do movies, TV shows. It's, it all organizes, has the cover art, and is all there. There's mobile applications that you can use, which is where I usually yeah. get it. So I, I, I don't want to have to deal with NFS or, God forbid, Samba on my phone. That just that, that sounds like something that just would make me want to, you know, not. Well, VLC is pretty good. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Jerry. Yeah, that's what I wanted to say. NF yes, you can do just NFS and then play the video file directly, but Jellyfin, you can think of more like Netflix. You have your library, you can see everything with the color cover art and everything, and just pick, let's say you want to watch one of the old Knight Rider movies or shows or stuff like that. You can just choose that one and be done with. Yeah, no, yeah. It's, it's like it's like Plex. It yeah, is Plex. The, yeah. the, the, the thing is about Plex that I heard from my friend is that it uses a graphic card and the computer to like uh, encode the yeah. video so that it's easier to stream over the network or yeah. something or easier for the device to play back or, or something. But I would it would, yeah, would that mean that it wouldn't work if I just play back the file or it would be like a lag? Um, would it work? If you if you just do the SMB stuff, then it would probably be rendered using the CPU, and that that of course that's slower because a graphics card just is way better for stuff like video encoding, and yeah. So having a half decent graphics card to for that video encoding would already be a huge benefit in terms of performance. Steve? Yeah, and uh, to, to, to add to what Jerry was saying, it also gives you the benefit of uh, being able to customize your viewing experience. You can add subtitles, you can watch the trailers. If you have bonus content, you can queue up the bonus content, watch the bonus content. You can, and uh, also uh, Plex allows you to set up the uh, backend player. You can, on Linux, you can set it to MPV, VLC, uh, the included player whatever you want with SMB, number one is going to be rendered by the CPU. Number two, you cannot do uh, simultaneous streams 
you cannot do anything. You're limited to one stream at a time. So basically, if you are a family, you want to uh, each person, each one of the family wants to watch a movie, a different movie in the same house on a different TV. You can do that on Plex and Jellypin. But the benefit of Jellypin over Plex is it doesn't have any proprietary features behind it. It's all open source. Unlike Plex, where it has a lot of proprietary shit behind it. Yeah, I might look into it. I might look into it. It sounds uh, like it's it fixes some issues. Maybe I might I might look into it. I ended up using it through the flat. The like I, I know Docker's awesome supposedly, but the flat pack was just stupid, stupid, dumb, simple to set up. You just install the flat pack and run it. <laughs> like that's literally all you do. The flat pack is so good for it. Oh, a server. You need a server. Yeah, the there's a flat pack of the Jellyfin server. You just download it from FlatHub, start it on 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 wow. boot, and it will and, and then navigate to the proper URL, set up, point it towards where your files are, and it runs perfectly fine. Now you do have to mess around with FlatSteel in order to give it permission to the files that you need, but you have to do that with everything anyway. It's just it's just, I mean, it, it worked phenomenally well. I I had struggled with Jellyfin for a very long time because the I, when I want to do something and I want to find a, a Steve, my man, you just murdered everyone on the stream. <laughs> All right. We talked about the mute button earlier. That was, <laughs> he's going he's, to come back to the mute button from earlier. All right, I'm, I'm gonna, just gonna leave him. I'm just gonna leave him on mute. I moved him. I moved him to audience. Steve, when you want to talk again, you have your audio fixed. Just let me know. That was that was horrendous. My ears are bleeding. Holy, <laughs> holy cow! I'm, I'm a little worried now to give him permission to speak. Oh, uh, oh, I have him on eighty five percent. That's why I, I didn't die. <laughs> Okay. I was wondering. All right. Uh, I, I have no clue, by the way, what I was talking about. Um. So. Uh. <laughs> Something about jell jellyfin, uh, but anyways, yeah, it was just very, very easy. Uh, Steve, I'm still, I still have a meeting. You had some very bad audio feedback, so I, I don't know what's going on there. Anyways, the so there are a lot of things like that, like jellyfin and and um, image and stuff like that that all look very, very interesting to me. So, are are there any specific like John? What if you had uh, if you set up one of these? What would the software be that you'd be interested in running? Well, the uh, software, it's mostly business stuff because I still am thinking about Nextcloud. I know you can host that yourself. Because uh, Nextcloud is like 20 bucks a month uh, to have them host it. That's crazy. Uh, I, I mean, all the other business stuff, like it, it's outside, it's $20 is not that busy, crazy, but it's outside my budget for a host. Um, but Nextcloud would be one of them. Invoice Ninja would be another one because I, I need a solution like that. There's something called Sugar CRM, which is a, a like client database. Um, and then really any of the GitLab is another one that I would use for work. I think uh, GitLab is cool for like dot files and other than just coding stuff. Um, but that's got all kinds of project management features that's added to it. Um, that are neat because a lot of these so like I use GitHub right now for most of my projects, but there's that's problematic in a few ways. And having a, uh, a backup, mirroring them between uh, GitHub and GitLab is good, but I'm uh, paranoid maybe. So, <laughs> so being able to mirror all three into my own hard drive just makes me feel comfortable. That makes sense. <laughs> you know? Self-hosting GitLab would be awesome because the if you wanted to if you use GitLab and it, it, GitLab just the regular host, hosted version is fantastic, but once you p get to the point where you're running out of storage, their storage prices are absolutely fucking atrocious. It's so bad. Yeah. Uh, Trollbush, go ahead. Yeah. So I I think we should we should talk about this a little bit. Uh, what are you looking forward to? Because Everyone here talk about different things. My server is local only, 100%. I'm not. It doesn't touch the outside world. If you're gonna uh, do something like private bin or where actual other people are gonna have to use it, probably not gonna use it by yourself because you could just use an encrypted drive and then put your files there or, or do something else. Um, 
Well, if you're going to put something like Nextcloud or something where you want other people to use it, you have to use it so it's public network. So you need to have a, a, a static IP and or maybe I, I know some what people do is that they buy a server with static IP but very little like like very a super tiny server somewhere hosted somewhere and they they put the WireGuard VPN and then they they put it in their house so that the server uses that IP and it, you don't have to open up your your house network and you can use that server IP only on that one server because it 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 runs on that server like a like a VPN and it uses that private IP that you buy by buying a VPS somewhere, then you get an IP. But otherwise, you have to open up your house network. Usually, you don't have a static IP because we don't have a lot of IPv4s left. We're using NAT now, and that could be a problem. And you would have to use like a a, a dynamic DNS, I think, or something. I'm not really. What, I don't what, really know a lot about you, this. You use. But do you guys do you want to use? Basically, what I'm saying is, I mean, I guess I'm uh, I'm asking Matt. Uh, do you want to actually have it? Uh, do you want to just host stuff locally, like I'm doing for now? Or do you actually plan on having something external where you can access it externally? Well, I'd want to access it externally, but I'd use TailScale or Nginx to make sure that everything's working properly outside of the network and wouldn't have to worry about opening up ports and stuff. Because that's apparently Nginx is astonishingly simple to set up, so is TailScale. Uh, and a lot of desktop environments now have TailScale built right in because it just uh, sits on top of WireYard. So, um, Steve, go ahead. Yeah, that's what Steve sounds like. Yeah, <laughs> Steve, we can't hear you, bro. You're not, and I don't have you muted. You... Oh. No, I know I didn't. Ha I unmuted him. <laughs> I was brave. We can't hear you. <laughs> All right. Um, don't know what's going on there. So, but yeah, I'd want to go. I I I would want it available externally, but the tail scale and the engine X would. But just for you. Using a VPN. Yeah, yeah, just for me. I, I'm not gonna like post it for I, millions. My, of people my friend has something really cool. He has only the WireGuard VPN opened. He can WireGuard into his house, into the 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 main server that he has like running as a router, running PFSense, and he he he, he like connects to that like router server, and then he has access to everything hosted in his house, including his computers. He can SSH into them, and that's really cool. Um, he only has to open one thing to the to the outer outer world, and then he can he can make anyone that he wants in his family log into his house. And that way, also, he doesn't need a VPN because if you use a VPN just because you don't want to like connect on like uh, like like a web cafe, you you connect to your house using your own private keys that you have. You know, so it's like SSH making your own private key, so it's super secure. You know your keys, you know you're safe, and you're connecting to your own house. That way you don't, if you just want to protect yourself when you go out to McDonald's free Wi-Fi, you can just use your own and into your house. So that way you only trust your yourself. Yeah. But if you want to protect yourself from your ISP, like a VPN, like, you know, when torrenting uh, Linux ISOs, um, well, then you uh, you want to uh, use an actual VPN. Yeah. Probably. Steve, I still can't hear you. I don't know what's going on there. Uh, I don't have you muted. I have your volume. I... Can you guys hear Steve? I can hear him. You guys yeah. can hear him. I can't hear him. That's really effing weird. Um, <laughs> fucking Discord. Um, just a second, Steve. We're, we're, I'm gonna work on this. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what's going on. Why does Discord hate everyone's guts this morning? It's so fucking stupid. Um, let's see here. No, we're not gonna. Hi, Steve. <laughs> yeah, I still can't hear you. Why? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Why can't I hear you, but I can hear everybody else? Uh, let me m mute you, and then unmute you. All right, say something now, Steve. No, still no. Uh, I, I, I don't get it. Uh, go ahead. We'll get. Uh, yeah, everybody else can hear Steve. Matt can't hear Steve. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. I, I can hear everybody else. Uh, I have... Yeah, I definitely... I realize you can't like switch all this up like right now we're, we're, we're yeah we're never we're, doing it this way again ever yeah this is, I, i'm open to yeah it doesn't have to stick on discord for me like i will follow you guys wherever you want to go whatever platform you want to put it on i don't i don't mind at least you know for me i'm i'm voting for uh the, the other discord uh community channel was fine um except if it gets real busy if there's a lot of people on there that yeah are talking over well, each other. Well, and that might just be a polite thing people who are not polite can get 
muted. But if you're just polite about it or raise your hand like we've been doing, um, I'm okay with that. Just can you hear me really now? Man? Yes, yeah. I can hear you now. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck, yeah, I, I I agree, John. This is not, and this isn't any better than what we did before. I mean, we're still basically having yeah. to do this thing. I mean, it's just it, it's just more complex and and breaky. <laughs> yeah, and I so, would just uh, yeah, I'll follow you guys wherever you want to go, whatever platform you want to go on. Yeah. I would just people who are impolite should get muted. That's it. Just be polite. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll figure out something different. All right, so let's uh, let's see if we can just ride it out okay. this time. Go ahead, Steve. Yep. And his his audio keeps breaking. <laughs> go ahead, Steve. Talk, just... talk, Steve. Let, talk, let's Steve. Go, Steve. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, what I wanted to add to Matt's uh, thing is that uh, Jelly, uh, I mean, uh, Nginx and Tailscale are amazing tools. You can; they're very easy to set up. And this is what helped me because my ISP closes all my ports. So what I'm doing is I'm routing all the traffic through my VPS that I, that I pay, what, $10 for a year, uh, thanks to Kudu again. Uh, but I'm, reroute, I'm just using the VPS to reroute all, uh, all the traffic to be able to access my, my stuff outside the house over 3G. Uh, and it was, what, five minutes to set up? It was, um, it's amazing. So, uh, yeah, Tailscale is an amazing tool and, Eng and Nginx is a must because you need to renew the certificates for all your, if you're passing everything through a domain that you own, uh, you need Nginx. Like I'm routing everything through zerolinux.xyz. Uh, for example, Joplin is jop.zerolinux.xyz. So I, I access it that way. Vault Warden is vault.0linux.xyz. So, uh, uh, amazing. You ever pissed me off, Steve? Now I'm going to go DDoS your Joplin server. <laughs> <laughs> we can all come together in one log where we try to pen test his server. So you upload that he has, and we all we all update your Linux. Update your Linux. Okay. Well, good luck. Okay, let's my, go. Good luck because my Raspberry Pi is off. Uh, ninety percent of the day, I only turn it on when I need it. <laughs> well, that's just yeah, that's just fun. not fun. <laughs> how, how are we supposed anything, to do this? Yeah. Go ahead, John. <laughs> anything that anything that's critical shouldn't be exposed to the outside world either. This is a general. Yeah. I'm that I'm that paranoid. I have a bunch of air gapped hard, air gapped hardware. It's never touched the internet. I I, yeah. I agree with you, John. That's why I uh, my, I do it on my Raspberry Pi, and I I turn it on only when I need it for five minutes, and then turn it back off. So yeah. Just air gap it is the best way to get yeah. are really that concerned about it. Yeah. I think anyway, there's, there's, a lot, there's tons there's tons of stuff you should be concerned about that should should not be on yeah. the internet. Uh, yeah, but if you're really concerned, as I said earlier, uh, you can also just wire guard into your house and just make sure that wire guard is safe and then you wire guard into your house or tail scale and then you access the stuff so you don't need to set up separate like remote facing services that people can manually then try to pen test them. Yeah. But like track the password individually of the different thing. Yeah. yeah. I worry that if I set this up that I'm going to have to become a, like I have to get a network certification in order to get get half of this stuff to <laughs> actually work. Uh and that's a little worrying because you you got to kind of know at least. I mean, Tailscale and Nginx are really easy to set up, but you still have to manage them a little bit. And if something goes wrong, then you have to be able to have some knowledge of how, you know how they work or how to troubleshoot or whatever. And that's going to entail a lot of learning. Yeah, this is, especially when if you are using Cloudflare like I am, uh, going through the uh, uh, handshake between Cloudflare and Nginx is a nightmare because there's this uh, hash code that you need to use. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. It, it can become a, a nightmare. So thanks to Kudu, I was able to bypass all that. John? Is there, does anybody have a good uh, resource for where they went to learn that? Like where they went to, like I mentioned earlier, Learn Linux TV, he's got a pretty long playlist. Um, like to get your feet wet. I know Linux, um, Foundation has a real shitty course. Uh, I'm not a fan of the Linux Foundation, in case anybody uh, is curious. Uh, yeah. they, have, they, have, they have a course for it. 
Um, if, you, if you want a teacher, go to Kudu. Go to Kudu. I don't. We can't. I don't want to like all you know twenty people like Kudu teach us. Like I, I ask questions. Kudu's a good dude. I know Jerry's willing to help, but he's also not my dad, so he's not going to sit down and set up my server for me. So. <laughs> So the way I learned it is pretty funny. I was just doing learning by doing. Yeah. I I set it up, checked uh, checked everything out. Okay, th this is how you do this and that. This is how you do that, and yeah, that's how I ended up learning all all of that. I had no guides or stuff like that if i really didn't f couldn't figure it out then i looked it up but i mostly checked everything myself and really tried to set everything up on my own yeah I, that's how i learn a lot of times is uh, go poke it with a stick and see what it does and then redo it and then if I really can't figure it out, I go look at the documentation. But that I, that tends to take me longer to, to figure that out. But I do, I do, I do do that. I just go, what does this do? What does that do? Oh shit, that broke it. Oh shit, All right, what does this do? What's this button do? <laughs> yeah. So there are. Uh, yep. If you want to, I mean, the so the way I learn a lot of stuff. The way I learned Python is to go searching around for tutorials on YouTube. And yeah. the problem, YouTube is fantastic. And it's also the worst thing ever. So either you're going to find a tutorial that's really awesome or yeah. you're going to find a tutorial that that guy doesn't know shit and he's trying to yeah. teach you. Um, I'm usually the guy who doesn't know shit is trying to teach other people. But the there are a couple that I found just searching for Nginx that there are a couple that have a lot of views. Usually the ones that have a lot of views are okay. Um, mm. They took away our, our thumbs ups and thumbs down so we can't really see... Uh, that metric, but, mm. but um, wait a minute. Does oh, I was gonna well, say, does does Jay have another channel or something? Because he he's on something called the Akamai Developer Channel. So he um, so I could talk about that. Uh, Akamai Developer Channel is Linode. They changed their name. It's not yeah. Linode anymore. It's Akamai, uh -huh. and they have uh, a list of. I guess they're their influencers because they partner with them. So you can find uh, the, the Linux experience is on there for some reason. Like they have playlists of like where they have guest people do videos. Yeah, so Gardner Bryant and uh, they messaged me and asked me to do it. And they pay a hundred dollars per video. That's what they pay. Um, that was a hundred bucks, huh? hundred bucks. Uh, I'm assuming that's probably just my rate. <laughs> I'm serving if you when at that point I had like ten thousand subscribers. So I'm, maybe if you had more subscribers, you got paid more. I don't know. I, I just was scrolling through here and saw Jay's face on their channel. I was like, oh well, he maybe he has another channel. But I forgot that they had changed their name to yeah. to Akamai. Yeah. Uh, okay. I haven't sense. had a chance. To, I haven't had a chance to use them yet. They're on my list of stuff to look at, but I haven't had a chance to really use them. I have a, like a five dollar one that I pay for off and on. Uh, that I can just kind of mess around with. It's, it's like when I wanted to learn how, how to do SSH, that was the way that I did it because I needed something to SSH into. Um, yeah. So that's how I learned SSH is it just set because it, it's like five bucks. Um, yeah. But yeah, there's there's quite quite a few. So let's go ahead and actually talk a little bit about virtual machines because I, mean, I know that Docker and Podman are the new hotness. But you hear, I mean, virtual machines are kind of like the old fashioned old man's way of doing things. So like there's things like Proxmox and uh, stuff like that. Uh, and yeah. I think that if I were to get into this, that I'd probably be running a lot of virtual machines because I'd want to be, run, have things. Um, I, I know Dockers are containers and they're, they're containerized by nature, but I'd want to be more control over the, the actual things being separated. Um so that's probably the way that I would do it is to have uh, either Proxmox or um, just run regular KVM virtual machines. Proxmox seems to be the way that everybody recommends it, right? For home lab, if it's small, use Proxmox. Yeah. Yeah. Because I know if you're going to get Docker and you've got it gets complicated at all, you have to use Kubernetes or something similar, and Kubernetes is not easy to work with. I can't even. And spell that's it. for 
that's Ooh. Kubernetes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, but that's that's enterprise level uh, tech. So if you're running just a few things, I mean, what would be you know what would be used in a, a home lab? Um, that's way overkill. I've heard lots of good things about Podman, but I I only looked at it and used it once, so I'm not not an expert on it. Uh, it seemed easy to use. Um, and Docker, uh, I'm usually using somebody else's Docker container, not building something for myself. Yeah, I, I really need to learn more about Docker. <laughs> for whatever reason, it's um, very intimidating for me. I, apparently, it's really easy, but I'm just very yeah. intimidated. It is. By it. it is. It is easy, but most of this stuff, most of the, that, just talk about personal experience. Like, there's hard stuff out there. Um, but even the hard stuff, if you're just patient, it's not that it's not that hard. It's just got to be patient because most I, I find that the documentation sucks everywhere. But we all know how to do this stuff. We can all learn. Yeah, I'm I'm gonna be learning off from YouTube because you're right. Documentation is almost universally bad in in most places, and, and which sucks. Uh, yeah, which sucks for me because I. I my problem with YouTube is I got to watch it like two times speed because I'm impatient and then I miss something. And then I have to go back and find it. I would rather just read the book. Well, that, like and, that. I'd rather would just read the stupid book. Uh, but they're all they're all shitty. So. As as a YouTuber, I I can very much attest to the fact that not all YouTubers are good. In fact, most of, most of us are are bad. <laughs> like I, you're I'm a good YouTuber, man. I watched your video on uh, shit on my note taking application last night. I watched it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just. <laughs> I don't always agree with you, but I watch your videos. <laughs> can't I can't stand vaults? I'm telling you, man. And everybody in the in the th in the comments was like, "Man, just use one vault." Like, I'm 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 compartmentalized. I want things. It doesn't matter. Um, yeah. The 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 thing is with the watching things on YouTube is, is that the quality is really just hit or miss. And, and it's my favorite way of doing things is to learn stuff on. By some, I mean, first of all, it's free. I can go there. So, I mean, you know, I don't have to pay for it. And but the problem is, is that there's some people who are really good at it, explaining stuff. Some people are really bad. Uh, go ahead, uh, troll bus. Uh, yeah. So you talk about, um, well, I, earlier we talked about like Docker for two seconds. So uh, I was just wanted to to head in that I, I did mess around with Docker because I did have like some school related stuff with it and it's pr fairly easy. I mean, if you're, if you're not going to be using, if you're not going to be making your own uh, like images, you just look at the readme of whatever project you want to look into. Like there was this one thing, this one project that I wanted to use that I was almost going to install on that Debian computer I talked about, which is basically it's a web interface written in like Golang, I think. And uh, it's basically you can open it up and then you see all your hard drives and their health. But I'm more minimalist, so I'm just going to SSH to my server every now and then, uh, and then run a couple commands to check if my hard drives are okay. Or I'm just going to make that send over to my phone using NTFY, using a, a, a script in a Chrome job, because that way I don't have to touch. Uh, I don't have to touch. Uh, you know, all of that other stuff. But if I did want to install it on my server, and my server was 64-bit because I realized that they didn't have a 32-bit image uh, available. Which then I think I could have maybe made it work if I made my own image, but but basically, it's a little bit like an image. Basically, basically they, they have a file and they have a bunch of commands that takes a Linux distro that's empty and puts the stuff in there. That's basically what they do, and then you just download that and it magically installs it in the container, a little bit like a distro box that gets set up exactly like you want, and then it just you you just set it up with a couple flags to like give it like a config file and move it into that environment and then it just works it just starts the the server and it kind of just works so it's actually very easy as long as you don't have to actually modify it but if you want to make your own docker then you have a file and you have a bunch of lines of action to do that creates the image or like basically the distro cuz think of basically like a a small distro without a kernel running on your kernel as, it, Docker isn't really that complicated if you're just like grabbing someone else's stuff, but yeah. Docker Compose. literally just work. Compose. And it uses a YAML file. Oh, good. I'm I'm in then. I love YAML. Yeah. <laughs> Pod, Podman works the yeah, Podman works the same way. 
It's the same. It's the same idea. It's yep. just container. And there's there's other <clears> ones <throat> besides that. I can't think of the names off the top of my head, but they're just containers. Docker just happens to be the commercial one. That's everybody's favorite, but I think only because they got popular first. I think Podman might be. I think Podman's yeah. the Linux favorite. Linux community seems to be. I'm not sure why, but both of them are open source. Yeah, I I don't. I think you could also manually have containers. You can have like an LXE or LXDE or whatever. And it's basically just a container, but that's basically just an empty distro. And then you just manually install the stuff in there. But with Docker, what happens is you have a file. It's a little bit like NixOS where it says, here's what I want. And it just kind of does it and it installed your stuff for you. That's basically yep. the difference between Docker and just a pure container. Pure container would be kind of like DistroBox, I think. Yeah. I don't use DistroBox as nearly as much as I used to. Um, cause I... Well, now, now that I am on Fedora, I use it. I have to use it because I miss my arts. I forgot that. Are you, Steve, are you actually running Arch as a daily driver, or or not Arch, but Fedora as a daily driver, or do you just are you just you just experimenting with it? I'm using it. I'm using it as a daily driver in the store. Yes. Wow. I'm I'm in Rawhide Forty One right now. Cool. I I didn't think I'd ever see the day. To be honest with you, I thought you'd be using your Arch ISO forever and ever. Uh, what, is it just for uh, shits and giggles, or did you break Arch and no. not want to fix it? It's growing on me uh, to the point where um, it might replace Arch if it continues that way. I I'm sorry, Steve. Jerry, what the hell is that thing in your head? <laughs> The German that, Coke bottle. Coke? That is a very a oddly shaped bottle. I'm just. <laughs> you see how the German engineers everything? Look how easy it is for him to hold it. It's just a Coke bottle, but it's all engineered with a little speed grip on it. Like it, it has a handle. <laughs> that, we all need that thing. <laughs> it's got a little. Yeah, it's got speed grip on it because the Germans engineer the shit out of everything. It's, we have these big, gigantic two liter bottles. You can't hold on to them. You know, you just fall. They yeah, just but fall Americans, out. Americans yeah, you have are to all by the top and it hurts. Like your fingers. Yeah, co yeah, Americans drink Coke like this. <laughs> I, I saw him take a drink. I was like, what the fuck is that? Demonetize. <laughs> that, 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 I, I'm sorry. I just saw. It. I was like, "Wow, that's a, that's an interestingly shaped bottle." <laughs> okay. Um. <laughs> yeah, believe it, people. I am on Fedora, not on Arch. And that that's... Fedora's Fedora's like as a daily driver. If you are doing stuff that you're just like, hey, I'm not really going to mess around like now because I have a couple of different distros on different things. I mean, I have Pop on a laptop, and I have Mint on a different laptop that's super old, and then I have a development machine that's just Fedora with KDE, and, like, if you're just, like, I just want to get stuff right down, done right now, and I'm not, I'm not playing, like, Fedora is an excellent choice to just, I want to work, and then I have other distros that I go play with, or that I'm experimenting, or that I'm learning, um, but Fedora is an excellent choice, just, it doesn't have everything on it, sometimes it's a little irritating, uh, the Fedora uh, forums are not super awesome, but I probably Solu hate it. I probably every, hate everything, so you shouldn't ask me about the that. Solution, so the solution to that is uh, flat packs, number one. Number two, uh, DistroBox. But my problem yeah. with Rawhide is um, DistroBox, uh, I mean, Docker does not support uh, Rawhide because Rawhide is continuously moving. It's a testing distro. It's not yeah. meant to be used uh, as a daily driver. But uh, it, it's working so far. I didn't need anything that, uh, that uh, the, bes and besides that, if I need something that, uh, uh, like for my toolkit, to, to work on my toolkit, I just remote into my, uh, into my Arch install uh, upstairs via No Machine. It's a remote desktop uh, tool. And I work on my toolkit that way. But otherwise, uh, even Plasma 6, on Rawhide is stable a app, and they're uh, and they're running kernel six point eight dash sixty three for FC forty one, uh, and so far 
absolutely no issues. It's been solid. I even updated my uh, my Zero Linux Rice because people have been requesting it nonstop. I did all the work on Fedora Rawhide. I didn't need to touch Arch because it's a KDE Rice at the end of the day. So the widgets are the same. Everything is the same. So uh, it's working flawless. And I've been I've been using it for what two weeks now. Absolutely no, no, no crash, no nothing. And some and uh, Brody or I don't remember who told me, uh, just wait until they start working on the kernel. Well, so far, fourteen days, absolutely solid. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, uh, Trollbus. Uh, yeah, that was that just made me think about something. Uh, just a small interruption. Um, I was having. Like issues with my with my with my uh, SUSE system, but the other day I realized I I looked it up. Um, apparently I was using OpenSUSE Factory as the default repo, and that's like apparently before OpenQA, like just the raw like stuff from OBS of the actual distro. So all of the stuff from the main distro was coming from like the raw factory version on SUSE. And OPI lets you do this by default. It has like a, a thing. Uh, I, I should find the Reddit again that I found this. But but basically the 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 one the main repo that says like it said like open to it, it said like um like like main like like tumbleweed main or something. And basically that's like a development repo, and that just was added by by OPI at some point when I installed something and like. Half of the stuff on my computer was from that repo. So I just removed that repo. I did a dup, uh, no uh, allow vendor change. And it's just um, now everything is coming from the, the main repo that comes with OpenSUSE. And it, it had like no issues. So I, I think that OPI is like a bad thing because if you press the wrong thing, it installs stuff that's available in the in, mm -hmm. in zipper using uh, like the, the unstable repo. Well, you just have and to pay it, attention like, to what repo. Stuff. You just have to pay attention to what repos it's adding. It asks you every time you install something via OPI, it asks you, do you want to keep the repo? Always just say no. Like, yeah, it's going to not, you're not going to get updates, but that's fine. Um, just, just always add it. But actually, the thing that's really important is make sure that you don't have, um, you don't have like a check your repo, do a zipper repo details, everyone that has OpenSUSE, and make sure that you don't have a main repo that looks like a main repo, but that says in the URL, uh, open source uh, factory because if if it says open source factory, um, then it it's probably bad. It should say open source tumbleweed because then it has went through open QA and whatnot. Uh, I you, have you guys should look into that. I have a ton of KDE repositories because I install Plasma six. I have uh, non non OSS open H two six four OSS debug source tumbleweed and that's it and Pac Man. And then a couple of OPI uh, or uh, OBS repos uh, for specific applications. So no, I don't have I don't have a, I don't have a factory or anything. Um, not not that it would worry me too much if I did. I I went through and cleaned out a whole bunch of my repositories the other day because I had added a few. Like I when I was using Vivaldi through the repository or through the RPM, uh, it adds the repository so you can get the updates i removed that because i use a flat pack now so I, I cleaned that up quite good um but let's kind of circle back to the the main topic if we can the um i think that uh what's going to be interesting for me because I, I am going to do this in the next few weeks like i i, I was this close to pulling the trigger on our mini pc like the, yesterday because there was a there was a sale on new egg for one of like the top of the line ones like it's normally like 900 bucks and it was on sale for like 6.99 i was like no not quite there i want to I, I added it to honey so it's going to tell me if it gets any cheaper um so i was really really close and so it's going to happen in the next couple weeks for sure i'm going to buy this thing and when i do I'm going to be messing around with all this stuff and you guys probably will never get any videos from me because I'm just going to be doing this all the time. And I, I think that this is going to be a rabbit hole for me. You guys think that once you start this or if you've already started it, that it kind of is going to end up being a rabbit hole for you? Go ahead, Steve. Absolutely. It's a rabbit hole. Yeah, John? 
Absolutely, it's going to be a rabbit hole. I already I wrote down a lot of what you guys said. Um, some of the things I already knew about, like Proxmox. Tail scale, I don't. That's well, familiar, you... but I don't think I had heard about that before. But Nginx, I've set that up a ton of times. That's easy. Uh, it looks good. The I'm still, like you said, I'm still uh, I'm trying to figure out what hardware I'm going to use because um, I'm in a boat where I need low power consumption. Um, definitely need low power consumption. And I like the idea of running a mini PC because it'll trickle. I like a Raspberry Pi because it'll be like super trickle. But I don't think that's going to be uh, uh, enough for my for what I want to do with it. So I might end up getting a uh, a tower or something like that. Um, I think that might be my tower with multiple bays. Uh, I think that'll be my best bet. But I'm gonna. I was going to ask you earlier if you wouldn't mind um, putting a channel. For home lab or is that too much we can we i'll talk around talk it around with yours and the rest of the mods and see what we can do uh we might just add it to the hardware um channel uh but then again that'd it, be fine it also does the software so we, we have hardware and software but they're kind of separated uh, i've been thinking about um I've been thinking about adding uh, a home lab one, but I don't know whether or not I'd be used or not. Well, granted, I didn't want to add the gaming one, and people have been using the crap out of that, so maybe I don't know uh, what's going on here. The maybe, uh, do, maybe, a, get, maybe do a poll. Get some, yeah. I'm showing you right now. Get something like what I'm showing you right now. This is uh, it's like a it's like a VCR kind of thing. I always wanted a VCR. That's amazing. Great. Elephin, because you can modify, you can play with the volume from here. You can change uh, hard drives. You can switch hard drives from here. Uh, it's got an LCD display over here, uh, and you can connect external drives over here. Don't mind the firewire because this I was is gonna say, is that firewire? Jeez, <laughs> damn, <laughs> haven't seen that one in a while. <laughs> yeah, I've had this. I've had this case since two thousand and five. Yeah, that explains it. And it's got a dead motherboard and a CPU in it, a Core i5. But uh, I'm waiting to get a new, uh, new hardware for it. But I've, I've had this case since 2005, and this will become my Proxmox server. This is my future Proxmox server. So, um, yeah, the, these cases, uh, you'll find a ton of them, and they range between... Uh, fifty to 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 eighty dollars. They're not much. Well, you can get a you can get mini and PCs for really cheap. I mean, like there's and if you, especially if you, even new ones can range from like one hundred and twenty bucks. Um, yeah. but if you go to like eBay, you can get really really cheap mini PCs. Great, but um, I, I'm obsessed with the mini PCs because, like you, John, I'm, I'm very worried about power consumption because I don't want to. Electricity is expensive AF. I don't want to have to. I, I don't want to increase it by like even twenty dollars. Like I want to. Like yeah. I, I there's, just want it to be very very cheap. Yeah. There's seven people in my house, and all of us are running hardware like all day. Like everybody works online. Everybody works remote. The only one who works outside the house is my mm -hmm. wife. So everybody's on a tower all day. <laughs> Well, the old, the old man, he's not working, he's retired, but his, he's got his phone charging, his tablet charging, his laptop charging, he's on Facebook on the tower, like, he's watching a movie, yeah, everybody's got the lights on. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, War Thunder, I'm sure, has a ton of stuff about home labs. Yeah, he's the one I was hoping who would talk, because I know he's got him and Jerry, I know, are experts. Go ahead, War Thunder. Enlighten and, and yeah. us, man. No, with, with your with your Linux Mint greatness. Are you running Linux Mint on a server? <laughs> are you are you No, <laughs> I thought about it though. It'd be funny. <laughs> uh, I mean at that point it's what? just basically a Ubuntu server with a GUI front end. Like what's the point? Like yeah. cinnamon on um, your server. <laughs> no, I have Debian 12 on my server. It's actually uh, the same mini PC it looked like that uh, Jerry was using is what I have. It's an Optiplex 7050 micro tower. I got it for 75 bucks, no RAM, no SSD. Um, and I've been messing with Casa OS on it because that was something uh, Steve had mentioned at one point on one of your videos or podcasts or something like that. And it does a pretty good job for what I ask it for. I, I want to rebuild it. I want to actually build um, an actual box out that's just like one thing because 
I've kind of outgrown the Synology NAS I had next door. I actually put it in not this chat, but the other chat. But I have that Synology NAS doing most of the documents and pictures. And then I have, um, I want to set up a next cloud, but I'm just playing with it for now to, to manage that instead. Um, and then I mostly use the Optiplex for uh, Plex server to do all the Plex stuff. I have Jellyfin on it. I was using Jellyfin. I've gotten Plex to work a lot better for me. It was at least a lot more responsive and whatnot. But so far, I mean, I haven't had that server fail me yet. Um, and like the big thing was we started digitizing all of our DVDs because, well, my internet here, as you saw at the beginning of the group here, literally I went to hit join. I heard a boom outside and my internet went down for 20 minutes. And that's just what it does in the summertime. It's literally afraid of all forms of weather and sunshine. So I just started buying DVDs because you can go to Goodwill and buy some of these DVDs for two to five bucks a piece. And I've got everything from, I've started doing some of the animes my wife watches to we started digitizing fairy tale. We started digitizing a lot of movies and whatnot. So when I'm sitting here and the internet's out, I can just, pull up my laptop, my router will still be working and just pull up Plex or pull up Jellyfin and go, okay, well, let's just watch a movie or let's just watch whatever TV series I own last. And right. That's one of the things I thought about too is the, uh, uh, my father-in-law, the guy's 80 and he was like the uh, uh, ancestry guy for the family, for his family and they're huge. Um, mm -hmm. Poland and here in the States and all that stuff. So he's got like boxes and boxes of uh, family photos and documents and, you know, history from that side of the family. And I got them all plastic wrapped and protected as best I can. But that's one of the things that I was trying to get him to do was to scan all that shit, digitize it. So one, mm -hmm. so we can share it with more people, but then also so that nothing happens to it. Cause paper doesn't last forever. Some of those photos, like he's got photos from the 1800s. So, like, it's an actual photo from, you know, 1895 um, from the family. So, uh, I, don't, I don't want anything to happen to that. But So, we're shopping for scanners and stuff like that. But that would be another use case that's not professional for me is to be able to digitize and have some place stored. And anything I can do to get out of the cloud. Uh, I mean, I, I still use cloud services. I have to. But, and I don't, I don't, I'm not against it. But uh, then being able to revoke movies I bought. <laughs> kind of kind of bugs me. You can snatch away my license on a on a movie I bought ten years ago. I'm probably never gonna watch it again, so I don't care. But the principle of the thing kind of bugs me. Yeah, yeah I do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it bugs, it bugs me, right? Like they get just gonna. I, yeah. I paid for it. Like I have a license, and then you, oh, we're not, we're not, we don't want to host it. It's too much bandwidth from a movie ten years ago. It's gone. I worry the Whatever. same thing about books now because I I've run out yeah. of of. Um shelf space for physical books and i read seven to ten books a uh, you know a month and i usually just buy the physical books because you know i prefer physical books but I, i've since had to move to digital i've talked about this on the podcast and i worry i worry constantly that the books that i get on kindle or whatever are going to go away so i've just not i've just said I'm not, I'm not buying digital books if i can I mean, sometimes I do, but most of the time what I do is I get them through Libby, which is the library, or I get them through Kindle Unlimited, which I know I won't own. So I'm, I'm actually happier right now not owning them at all because if they go away, it doesn't matter. I didn't pay for them. I'll just find them somewhere else. Right. It would bug the crap out of me if I paid for the things and then they went away, which I mean, I just have, yeah. I mean, there's the big examples of it like sony just recently taken away all the discovery stuff off the playstation so those things get heard about but it actually happened i mean and the thing is it's not even a new problem like when itunes first came around i mean that happened all the time and you know it's just now more of a thing now because more people are doing the digital thing but i, I think that uh, i mean not to be the crotchety old man and say oh this generation is not used to owning physical copies of shit but um, everybody's just used to Spotify now. You like you don't own anything. You just pay for the streaming rights. You go to Netflix or Hulu or whatever. You don't own any of that stuff. And if and everybody who 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 is a part of a a streaming service, you know that the content there is constantly in flux. Like sometimes something will be on Netflix. Sometimes it will move over to Max, and then it will move to Paramount Plus. And if you know, 
it's just a, a mess. Um, and then they wonder why we go all R, you know, yeah. uh, Jerry, go ahead. Um, my grandma actually got burnt by this, by the subscription thing because she had a Kindle and she bought a few books on that. And after three or four years, she wanted to read that one old book that she bought at the very beginning. And yeah, please buy it. Please buy it separate, separately now. It's not part of the subscription anymore. And she was like, screw you, Amazon. <laughs> yeah. she, she immediately, she threw the candle at the wall, went to the went to the local store and bought all of her books in a physical copy. Yeah. yeah. Theft, theft is theft. There's, there's something to be said about uh, uh, like having a book and you have like little post-its and you highlight shit and you have your little notes in the margin mm -hmm. and like it, the, you know, the, the, the binding gets old and busty. Like there's, when my wife and I first got married, like we were poor as shit. So we'd like sit out on the back deck in this little double wide in Tennessee and like read because we didn't have cable. Like we couldn't afford it. So like we'd read books like from the library and we would just like hang out and drink coffee and read these stupid books. Uh, or talk about the books that we were reading, like we'd, you know, both read the same book at the same time or like one after the other. There's something to be said about that. You don't it's not good to have a screen in front of your face all the time anyways. But I and I do but I do have a bunch of digital books because I read like crazy like Matt. Like I just it's one of my relaxing things I try. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a, a old uh, cell phone that the only thing it's got on is Google Play. Because um, uh, not Google Play, Google play books or whatever, because you can use it to uh, anything that's an EPUB, you can put it in your library Yeah, and uh, and read it. So I get a bunch of old books that are in there and it's a, it's a older phone, but it's still big enough. But like, I'll read off of that. If it's something I don't have a paper copy from. Trobus, go ahead. Yeah, it's kind of crazy how it, you, you actually get more freedom if you, if you pirate than if you actually spend the money on the popular places because you know i can go on annasarchives.org right now and i can get any wor book in the world for free in pdf form and that's going to be on my nas forever and you can't can you cannot take it away from me but if i buy something on kindle uh that's not the same thing they can take it away from me you can probably have it offline and and, and backed up and the the so, so I think the solution would be to, to actually buy PDFs because I think that there's a couple of people that, that sell PDFs still on their website. At least when it comes down to like like Linux books, maybe there's it's it's more there's more of it. I know that sometimes there is good uh good deals on certain uh books like that with Humble Bundle. They make a bundle about certain things. Maybe they should make a, a, a bundle about cell phone thing. So you can have like a Docker thing and other other books. But uh yeah, um I don't know. Is there? Do you know any good places to buy like PDF? I guess it it really comes down to like buying it from the guy who actually wrote it. Most of the time, it's it's usually just um, on the person's website. I don't. That I find them. I don't know about like nonfiction, but if you are, you want to buy stuff directly from the author, a lot of the times there's a place called, there's a service called Campfire that allows you to buy fiction directly from a lot of authors. Now, most of that stuff is going to be self-published stuff. It's not going to be from a lot of the big publishers aren't going to be a, a part of that because they're going to sell through Amazon because they got exclusive deals and stuff. But if you are mm -hmm. interested in the self-pub scene, which is, I mean, that's the direction where a lot of authors are going because it's much easier to do. You don't have to deal, mess around with agents and all that stuff. So, but Campfire is a, a place where you can go and you, they take like a, it's kind of like Steam where they, they take a small portion of it. That's how they make their money. And then the author gets the rest and it's the, their margins or whatever for the authors are, um, okay. Uh, and Vivaldi yeah. just crashed for whatever reason, and wow. and Steve was first. I'm trying to find the right workspace. <laughs> okay, there we go. Uh, go ahead, Steve. Uh, Vivaldi crashed uh, crashed on you. Yeah, he crashed on me like ten times today. It's it. I don't know what's going on. Are with, you using uh, with the Vivaldi flat pack? Are we talking books right now, or what happened? 
well, we were we were talking about uh, owning physical media and people seeing little steal oh, your yeah. uh, content off days, your devices. More people, more people get audiobook versus anything else. I have the entire Isaac Asimov audiobook collection. Fancy. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I pay for Audible. I, I, I've just, I've succumbed to the subscription nonsense <clears throat> because it's just easier. The, the, I had just, like I said, I had, I've had to go digital now. So it, instead of, the problem is, is like, I have an iPhone, that's my main phone and they have the iBooks thing, but I, I don't want to put any money into iBooks because it's, it's the only ebook service that's available only on one platform. So like if I, I give Google your money, if you want to, at least then you can in, install that application on whatever platform you can get an iPhone, Android, whatever. Um, you can read it in the browser if you want to. Um, but iBooks is very self-contained. It's only on, on Android. So I won't give them the money. And, and I, I decided that like, I can buy stuff from Kindle, which I do when it's not available on Kindle Unlimited. I was like, I looked at Kindle Unlimited. Kindle Unlimited is like 13, 12, 13 bucks a month, and you get access to all this stuff. And like, that's kind of cool. I'm gonna spend that much money on a on one book. I might as well have access to all the books. Uh, and then I do the same thing with with Audible. It's like 15 bucks a month. You get a book a month. It's great. Um, but <laughs> the, individually, subscriptions are very great, right? Like. Netflix, you don't think very much paying, you know, now it's like 15 bucks a month or whatever. It used to be like seven, but you know, you just, whatever, but you add all of them up at, at the end of the month. Like I have 12 different subscriptions or whatever. And like, oh my God, I'm paying just as much as I used to pay for cable. It's, it's, it's stupid. Uh, War Thunder, go ahead. I was going to say, if you do audible stuff, uh, my wife does a lot of the audible and I actually found her in a open source client that will actually download those books from Audible to your hard drive. And then from there, you could put them out on a server or something like that. You should definitely share that with me so I can That's use what that. I do. That, that's exactly what it's I do. It's Open Audible, I, I think is what it was called. Yeah. Uh, the, the, toss that in the chat, container, please. Uh, there's a Docker container to, ho to manage your audio books that I have on my uh, Raspberry Pi. That's one I forgot to mention. Uh, I forgot what it's called, but it allows you to manage audiobook. It's called Audio Bookshelf. Audio Bookshelf uh, Docker container image. I just uh, pulled the image, set it up, put a username and password, uploaded all my audiobooks, and now I have 190 Star Wars audiobooks and the entire Isaac Asimov audiobook collection. That's the only two collections I have. Tell That's me you're a Star Wars fan without telling me you're a Star yeah. Wars fan. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, no, I gotta... well, I'm not a Star Wars fan. I'm a I'm a Star Trek fan. Star Wars is just a bonus that I uh, that I uh, uh, that I got after. But uh, Star Trek first, everything after. Well, at least you have it the right way around. Yeah. <laughs> to be fair, I also do like Star Wars, but it it's one tier down for me. Yeah, Star Trek first. But... Star Trek first. It it Captain James T. Kirk. Bring me up, Scotty. There you go. Yep. The uh, entire stream just hey, went full on nerd. Star Trek Discovery last season. <laughs> Star Trek Discovery last season, final season, uh season five. Final season starts April fourth. See, this is why I like my Plex server. Because I finally managed, um, ironically enough, I got the entirety, all seven seasons of Voyager. I got them digitized. I got them on my server. I was on season five or six. And then my parents stopped paying for Paramount. Wow. So the account I was logged into, I just suddenly lost my account history for that. And I was like, well, I know roughly what episode I was on. It's on my server now. Yeah. I just moved yeah, over to DVDs my Plex server or, and I'm finishing DVDs season. Or 1080p upscale. They're not. Yeah, they're they're the so the DVD <laughs> set I have is just the ones that were ripped off VHS tape with back way back when. So it's standard definition. Um, yeah, yeah. But I thought about seeing if I can re-encode them or if they would sell a better quality version. They've never remastered it. Yeah, the, uh, there I are think... fan remasters. Uh, yeah. uh, AI. They they call them AI upscales. Mm -hmm. uh, 
that I got, uh, the whole seven season collection occupies 1.2 terabytes on my hard drive. Jesus. I don't have that kind of space. Not yet. Yeah, I, have, I have a one terabyte I have, I have, right now. The, the Star Wars movies that they're, they've got the original reel from the 70s and they, they, they're they digitizing it in 4K every movie. And I got like a bunch of version of that. There's a forum. If you look at it, it's like uh, Star Wars... 4K and then it's like the the last, like seventy seven or something whatever year it came out for every movie. Oh yeah, yeah, look yeah. It up I know what and, you're and talking that's about. so cool. Yeah. I downloaded like I downloaded like uh, almost like a terabyte just of Star Wars movies multiple times just because I was nerding out looking at all because they show they have their forum and they show all the images quality of all different versions and you can look at them and you can you can peep frames and they they do color grades and they do it's it they go they have like a like a pdf that's like 10 pages where they like go into what they do and it's pretty amazing go ahead war thunder i say i'll I'll keep it short um the one downside to having all these upscaled things to like have on your server and whatnot one storage space like i said my current plex is only one terabyte which i want to rebuild oh. and have a bigger have a bigger library just haven't done that much plex yet um, but two, what people found out for like Star Trek The Next Generation, like I have the DVD set back here, is when they upscaled it for Blu-ray, you start seeing, oh, if I find it, I'll put it in the chat somewhere. There's a guy out of Texas that did a all the things that are wrong in The Next Generation because on the old tube TVs or on the old standard definition, you didn't notice all the mistakes and booms and shot and different yeah. things. But when they upscaled everything, you see like, little nicks in the carpet here or stains where like between two seasons, they had a bunch of cats get in and like vomit all over the set. So there's parts of the set that are still like stained early on in one of the seasons. And you didn't notice that you get, on your you tube get, you TV see back in detail. the day. But... You see more detail. You yeah. See more detail. <laughs> that happens on all of the, like all those shows that get upscaled. And part of it is the aspect ratio. The aspect ratio widens out. So what was not in the shot when they made the TV show now like you can see the yeah. shadows from the, the crew and all that other stuff. The the one that I found the funniest about Star Trek is they had uh, reflective surface surfaces like on the Next Generation. Yep. Those little because uh, it was plexi. Yeah, the plexiglass that was mimicking their computer interface or whatever. It would shine into the camera off of the the backlight, so it it mess up the shots. So what they would have to do is take like black construction paper and like stick it over something that was too bright. And sometimes they did a pretty good job of making it look nice so that you didn't really catch it. But because of the contrast in 4K, you, yeah, you can now see you it see there. It. And then other times, like, you can see somebody didn't give a shit that day. So it's like, <laughs> it's like, half oh, there's stuff they left. yeah, there's stuff they left in shots because, like, ah, no, it's fine, you know? Yeah. Uh, like, they somebody's, forgot to put up ladders on certain shots. Yeah. Somebody's coffee cup, the doors are leaning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so to close this, there's some uh, funny stuff to close the sub the subject out i'm just going to say that i recently got Oppenheimer in 4k 109 gig yeah that's my one issue with blu-rays okay. when i started digitizing blu-rays yeah that's a lot of data like my blu-ray drive will sit yeah. and run for like four that's hours why, that's why i'm deleting that. that's why i'm having to delete old stuff to put new stuff like uh, recently, I got MacGyver, the, the the real MacGyver, Richard Dean Anderson. Uh, that was one point two terabytes. Lucifer was one terabyte. Uh, okay. uh, what's it called? Uh, Let me ask you guys this question: hundred gigabytes. <laughs> Why y'all need four K? Like, <laughs> just well, I have a four K TV. I have a four K TV. If you need ten eighty P, is perfectly fine. It also is. Just, yeah. just have a 4K TV, I, so you guys are all spoiled. I grew up on a small 1080p screen, but yeah, um, you guys, what if you get a 4K encode, but you don't put uh, HDR, it, it's and, and it's actually compressed like correctly, like it's going to be way smaller than than like 100 gigabytes. Yeah, H.264. It's going to be way H265. smaller, and if you don't need HDR and you just need 4K, this is, this is fine. Yeah, just you, don't need, you don't need 4K, John. 4, 4K movies in H.265 mm. instead of H.264, they're going to be around 10 to 12 gigabytes a movie instead of 100 and not. John? You guys are all spoiled. I grew up, our TV was a wooden hardwood console TV. 
don't know if you guys even know what this shit is. It's like a yeah. piece of furniture. Yep. And it had a dial on the top that had 12 digits. You had to like crank, 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 crank. It was loud as shit. And it had 12, uh, 13 stations on it. And it had a little zero at the top. And you would turn that one. And then you turn the one on the bottom. And you could get like extra weird shit. Like the Spanish channel. And uh, for me, my region, it was uh, WPR 50 or whatever. And we watched Star Trek The Next Generation at 7 o'clock on Tuesdays <clears throat> or something like that. MacGyver was on Wednesday. Uh, and big console, and then we had a Commodore 64 in the other room, and if you even walked by the Commodore 64 with a glass of water, even walked by it, a parent would, like, Spider-Man off of the wall and kick your ass because you had liquid by the computer. Like, it was a big deal. And then when <laughs> Nendo, Nintendo came out, I lost my mind for, like, two years straight. We had an Atari, but when uh, NES came out, like, that was it was crazy. Yeah, it was yeah. A- you guys with your 4K and <laughs> we're streaming all over the world with each other. So my first TV spoiled when I was young, I had uh, a Curtis Mathis, and it was in wood, and, and it had the knobs. Um, but that was that was 40 years ago. So, uh, Jerry, go ahead. What's up? I'm not. I'm not spoiled. I grew up with this one, <laughs> so I. I, I saw the world of glorious 240p. <laughs> and secondly, I also don't get why a lot of people really want 4K. This TV right here doesn't even support 1080p, just 1080i. And because I cannot set the aspect ratio, I had to set my Apple TV to 1024 by 768 and manually stretch the image to make it fit with six with the 16 by 9 aspect ratio. So that just sounds painful. It's fine. Well, there's some people out there now who are like, "Oh well, 8K is the next thing." Like we don't have that type of hard drive space, no. folks. Um, Trollbus, go ahead. Yeah, but I mean, basically, my rationale is I I, I paid. I paid, you know, I, I used to have a TV like that, like, you know, over there. And, you know, it was really bad. It was like 1080i and you could see the pixels even on the on the couch. It was it was really bad. And it was like super thick. It was like it was like literally like like this thick, like like like. And I mean, you know, it's not comparable, you know, to like super old stuff. But, it, you know, it wasn't like a flat screen, like like the one behind you. It was actually like like actually like this thick. And the, the, you can see the pixels and everything. Um, I mean, it's a, you know, it's a flat screen LCD, but an older one. And then I went, okay, I'm going to spend like good money, like maybe 600 Canadian or, or more, and I'm going to get 4K HDR. And I, I did that. Now I have that. And, you know, I'm going to use it. You know, I'm going to use it, which, you know, it, my parents have streaming services, so I, I did use it on there. And honestly, I would say that if you're far away enough from the TV, HDR versus not HDR, and maybe may, if you're if the TV isn't that big and you have both proper HDR and 4K HDR will probably make more of a difference because it, that is like really big uh, brightness difference. I can't tell the difference between 4K and, and 1080p. My eyes are too bad. Okay, it's just like yeah. it, like you the people out there who claim to be audiophiles and c- can tell the difference between you know whatever and whatever. Like I, it all sounds the same to me as long as there's not artifacting in it. I can it it sounds fine. I don't need super fancy thing. Uh, War Thunder, go ahead. I was gonna say my first TV was my parents had a. Hitachi uh, projection screen TV, one of those big box mm. boxy TVs. My dad had saved up for years for that. Yeah, and the first like console we ever in the had. house. Oh god, it actually came in two pieces. And the day we get rid of it, I had to actually help the couple that took it out of our like giveaway, like in the trash day, um, to their house because they couldn't lift it. It was a four man lift to get this yeah. big tube, <laughs> you know, moving. But it was it wasn't um 720p but it was really close it was one of the really high-end projection screens we actually found out my dad put like seven motherboards in it he'd kept taking it to a friend of the family and they kept just recapping it over and over again because it kept blowing caps yeah but the picture looked great um but the first console we had my brother bought and actually got in trouble for it because we weren't supposed to play games because my dad was against that um was the original xbox so he bought that around the time the 360 came out. His 
buddy at school bought a 360, said, hey, I'll sell you my Xbox cheap. And then that's that was my introduction to the game. It was the original Xbox with the big old Duke controllers and and whatnot. So, yeah, th- those things were really terrible, yeah. but I still love them to death. Like, yeah, it was great. I have them all now, but, you know, my, yeah. that was my intro. My, my cable ripped off the control, unfortunately. <sighs> I still have two for mine that are still in pretty reasonable shape. The only issue is I think mine's new enough that the clock battery won't murder it but I'm afraid to take it apart because the fans sound awful at this point. I mean, it sounds like a lawnmower. Um, I, um, send me the manufacturing date of your Xbox and I can tell you if it, if the clock capacitor will end up leaking or not. I, yeah, I'll go grab it at some point. I want to say it was either late 03 or 04. I could be wrong. It, it, it's not the last one that came out. I think it's the right before that. Okay, okay. It, then, if it's not the one point six, then the capacitor will most likely leak. Yeah. Hold on a second. I can probably go. Go ahead, John. All right, gen- gentlemen. I uh, that's my bell. I gotta dig out for the uh, for the week or for the episode. Um, do we know <laughs> what we're doing on the next one? Uh, we're gonna do a wing and a wing it episode. We'll just kind of chat about a whole bunch of stuff. Then we'll do another topic after that. Um, and uh, we will do something other than we'll either go back to a traditional room or we'll go to we'll do Jitsi. But I'll I'll let you all know what's going on with that. Um, was it was nice seeing everybody again. Can't wait to see you next time. Uh, have a good day. Thanks for joining us, John. Yeah, man. All right. Yeah. So I, I, I let's see. I got, hey, War Thunder actually just. You, you guys, I mean... It's literally just right over there. It's in my living room. <laughs> Jerry just should, had an N64. I should have brought my TV earlier when I was talking about it. Just it's Like Josh having props all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I go get my Sega Saturn if you want to see that. I don't care. I don't have, uh, I, it I don't have anything I, cool I can, for a prop. I, I can prop get my original Xbox, Xbox real quick, too. It's the 1.0 version. It's a launch okay, model. So where do you actually see the version number? Because on on the on the bottom on one of those stickers, there there is the big barcode, and above that, there's the manufacturing date. Oh, uh, anybody? That's gonna be a problem. Screen? This one's been apart before, and uh, I don't know if you can see why that might be a problem. Anybody can see my screen. <laughs> We see you, Steve. Uh-huh. So I'll have to take it apart. <laughs> if you look at if you look at my screen, you will see I have every single Star Trek TV show that was ever made. Star Trek, Star Trek, uh, uh, Deep Space Nine, Discovery, Enterprise, Picard, Strange New Worlds, The Next Generation, Voyager. <laughs> you should branch out, is what I'm saying. All right. Anyways, guys, I'm I also gonna have to to pop out here. I got some stuff to do. Um, this was it was a great episode. I, I'm I, I'm probably gonna buy my home server stuff tonight because I can't wait now because I want to go mess around with stuff. <laughs> um, so come on, spend need, that money, spend need... that good uh, that YouTube money, baby. Well, spend, that, spend that YouTube yeah. money. And and Matt, if you need help, hit me up. Yeah, I'll I'll ping I'll be pinging stuff in the uh in the chat anyways uh thanks everybody for watch or for uh for for joining this time it was a really good one uh the room will stay open if you guys want oh <laughs> actually i don't know if the room will stay open Should with we... this with this nonsense <laughs> i think once i leave everyone's mm-hmm. gonna get kicked off so need, make it make a new make a new uh channel right now so that people are going to stay uh, the, go all right so un- under the general category the voice chat is still there if you want to go use it um, oh okay yeah so sorry. um yeah it's just it's just called voice chat we've honestly could i've honestly forgot that i kept it but um if you get uh you guys want to go use that you can you can uh, but i do think that once i leave that everybody's going to get kicked off so uh, if, if that's the case um i'm sorry uh but i do have it's to an go. experiment <laughs> yeah yeah uh this channel <laughs> once everybody's out of it will go away and never come back because this the, the stage functionality <laughs> is the stupidest thing i've ever seen in my life all right anyways uh, <laughs> yeah
It's just so good. Yeah, ten out of ten, clearly. Yeah, it's so, yeah, so it, bad. It, it would it would be better if it it's... worked like uh, MS Teams. Anyone use MS Teams? You can like raise your oh. hand, but everyone is like speak can speak or something. Yeah, that's, that's, like, that's it product. shows an it shows an emoji next to your name. So yeah. like everyone is like, for example, everyone at the bottom there and here would have like a little emoji of like a hand being raised, and you can toggle it. That's what this was supposed can, to be. Like, um, yeah. And Zoom, and then you, Zoom and anyone can also open up their mic if they want to. Zoom and Jitsi do to... the exact same thing. I think they got it from Zoom. Um, but uh, th that's what this was supposed to be. But that's not what this ended up being. But that's okay. Anyways, I will. Um, I'm gonna hop hop off, and uh, I'll talk to you guys all later. Um, thanks for thanks for being here. See ya.